Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce John Williams. We first met over 50 years ago, I should say, uh, at the University of Kentucky. Uh, John was focused on accounting and um, serving in Army ROTC, two fields of study, I might add, that really don't lend themselves to entrepreneurial activity. Uh, but from those studies and experiences, he enhanced his immense analytical abilities, his attention to detail, and his self-discipline, which combined with his entrepreneurial talents and a great sense of personal integrity laid the foundation for his successes and for his being inducted this evening. In, in the founding of CSI, it should be noted, he conceived of this financial technology company while he was still a student. He founded it, he established it, he served as its CEO, and even today serves in a non-managerial capacity as chairman of its board. The significant things about CSI that reflect what John Williams is all about is not so much in its great service. Actually, it has over 5,000 clients across the country and serves over 200 banks here in the state of Kentucky. But the three things that I wanted to point out in introducing him to you is that S Computer Services Incorporated has been true to its investors. It has had 17 years of consecutive net income growth and 42 years of consecutive increases in its dividend. It's a great company. It's a company that has been, that values its employees. And again this year, it was among the top 10, I believe, companies in the state where employees rated it as a great place to work. Probably even more important, at least from my viewpoint, is that in 1969, John established a profit sharing plan for all of his employees that exists today. In a time when Companies across the country are t seeking to shed responsibilities, particularly in retirement benefits. It is noteworthy to note that every year, CSI has contributed to each individual employee between 9 and 15 percent of their salaries in this profit sharing plan. There are many people in Paducah and across the country that have realized the American dream by just being a part of this company. And lastly, and in the spirit of the entrepreneurial tradition that we're honoring tonight, this company has also valued the communities in which it works. And while it has some banks with nearly $4 billion in assets, the thrust has always been to serve community banks. At a time when the national conversation is about are, are some banks too big to fail, this company has focused on how can we keep the small banks, the community banks, thriving and successful, for they truly are the lifeblood of communities. And hopefully, in their support of small businesses and future entrepreneurs, that there will be individuals who receive a start from these banks who come on this stage in the years to come. A grand human being and a good friend, John Williams. What Dino didn't tell you is that he started buying CSI stock when he came to Murray as president. <laughs> and it served him very well. <laughs> You know, and I've been friends since we were freshmen at UK. We served actively together in student government. Uh, I was chairman of the Judiciary Committee in the junior year, and he chaired it in the senior year. Um, 
And I gave him one of his first jobs as a dorm counselor at Hagen Hall when I was head resident of Hagen Hall the first year it was open. Well, I'm honored to be here today, and that, that honor is felt deeply by just looking at your website and identifying those who've been selected in prior years. Uh, I, I'm just overwhelmed by being named among the 25 or so uh, who, who have been honored previously. Brief personal past. <clears throat> It is true that I wrote the business plan for CSI when I was a junior at UK. At that time, you could either take a board wiring class with some of that IBM stuff, unit record stuff, or one class in Fortran programming taught by Marty Solomon, who was a grad student then. Dr. Solomon later became head of the computer center at UK. And he had the wisdom to suggest that we ought to go to the library and read periodicals because in those days you could get a liberal education in technology by reading current periodicals. Unfortunately, that art has gone. That doesn't exist today, but it did in the early, in 1960-61. And at that time, I read an article about E13B font, which are the funny numbers on the bottom of your checks, and they were standardized in 1960, and the article was a question of what impacts that going to have on the velocity of money. I'd already had money in banking, understood the process, and what that meant, it was going to turn over money more rapidly, our economy was going to grow more rapidly, and the question then was, how can community banks across the country participate and benefit from that when it's going to cost so much money to put in computers and it'll go primarily to larger banks? So I wrote the business plan at that time, and I wrote the business plan on the theory of how do you build a company that can stay under the same corporate ownership for an indefinite period of time. And it had several key principles, and one of it was that you make a public company out of it. Another is you have no major stockholder whose priorities in life may change over a period of time, so we set a cap of 5%. At that time, we later adjusted it to 10 and so today's structure of CSI 50 years later is like it started in 1965. And it's the reason that we're the oldest computing company in the nation, where most others have changed ownership, gone out of business, merged, etc. And we're blessed to have great technology and great younger leadership. Steve Pallas, our CEO, is here, and he's done a great job of preparing new leaders. Now I want to back up and say that I went with Arthur Anderson. I was in the original consulting division of Anderson right out of college. And then I was a Signal Corps officer and spent two year, great years in Germany. And in those interim periods, the question was, how do I get this business started? I must tell you that I have, I'm, I'm the third of three brothers. Um, my older brothers were 12 and 14 years older. They're both gone, deceased today. But they both were CPAs and the largest accounting firm in West Kentucky was started by my two brothers. The last thing I wanted to do was to follow in their footsteps, but I did see the need in those days to create an automated solution for businesses in addition to banks. And so I put together a business plan to do that and suggested it to my brothers that they might want to consider it as a dimension of, uh, of the accounting firm. And in July of 1964, my older brother wrote me a letter. We had a lot of exchange of letters. And in that letter, he said <clears throat> that my mountain wasn't there. And that if my vision was as it was, I needed to search for my mountain or molehill by molehill build it. You talk about being motivational. That was for my older brother. And so, Six months later, we began building Molehill by Molehill, the CSI. Now, I want to say something about 50 years in business. Uh, we will be 50 years next spring, and it's so rare today to have anyone stay with the same company for that period of time. Uh, but it is true in my life. But I want to make an observation that I, I can't tell you how many times someone said it takes a different personality to start a company than it does to operate a company. And I haven't heard that from any of my compatriots who've been up here so far tonight. But from my experience, it's very true. Uh, I'm also a partner in a venture capital firm, and we're heavily invested in a number of healthcare fields. And in the venture business, we're, we're investing in early stage business, and then we're going to roll the business in five to six years 
And so the, the object is totally different than building a company that lasts forever like CSI. <coughs> but it is true, in my experience, that if you're going to build a company and stay with it for a long time, that you as the CEO have got to recognize when you have to change your traits. And it takes a different set of traits to operate a company than it does to start it. Now, I solved the problem in CSI by constantly creating something new in CSI. That's the key trait of an entrepreneur is creating something that didn't exist before. And so as a result, you will find under the umbrella of CSI all kinds of little companies. And frankly, I'd turn over what was already going on to other people and I'd, I'd go out and start other things. I guess one of the latest ones that I did under Steve Pallas, one day he came to me and he said, uh, I think what you ought to do is you ought to start an internet business. And this was 1995. And I had turned over the, most of the running of the business to him at that time. He, I gave him the company in 99 to run as CEO. And that's when I basically retired and set working on special projects for a while. But at any rate, in 1995, I essentially spent 95% of my time starting our internet company and business. And today, it's a very thriving part and under, undergirding a lot of the rest of what we do. Thinking of other key issues to those of you as thriving future entrepreneurs, another key thing that we did early on in our company was learn how to manage people remotely. You know, in our industry, many of the folks operate everybody under the same roof to be able to manage folks. But in order for us to grow, we had to have remote operations. And when you have remote operations, you got to learn to hire the right people and trust them. We also began putting people, letting people work out of their homes in the early 70s. And many of my peers looked at me as absolutely crazy for this telecommuting kind of thing. But frankly, our company has done it for a long time. We have 1,100 employees. I don't know how many of them telecommute today, but it's a bunch. But the culture of that and a structure within a company that you can accept and thrive on that strategy uh, started because we realized to grow we had to do that. And I, I'm, I'm a strong believer in that. I'm also a strong believer in the faith issue. I'm a strong believer in the family issue. I never will forget one day I walked down the corridor of our corporate headquarters and, and passed two employees. One of them had just lost a parent, and I didn't know it. And the other one just had a new baby the night before, and I didn't know it. Because I didn't spend a lot of my time around a water cooler learning what the latest information was. From that, we created an intranet and put a scroll and we wanted employees across the company to put things that were important in a personal life on a communication piece that everybody in every office would know at the same time. You talk about crystallizing awareness of family, caring for each other. It's a strategy that has worked very, very well for us. Well, let me close the comments. I'm honored. Thank you very much for this honor.